Today on Rift Beards and Gear, we compare my Gibson Les Paul against my PRS McCarty 594. So I acquired a new guitar, well, new, new to me. This is a 2018 Paul Reed Smith uh, SC McCarty 594. And this particular guitar is kind of weird in that this is a wood library guitar, yet it's still painted Alpine white, which is interesting. Also, I've been able to find just a, a couple of other ones that are similar to this guitar, but none of them have factory black pickup surrounds, which is also interesting, but this is a beautiful, beautiful guitar and being a McCarty named after Ted McCarty, the former president of Gibson guitars back in the fifties. And it was Les Paul that was launched along with many other guitars that was launched under Ted McCarty's direction when he was at Gibson. So I thought it would be kind of cool to kind of compare a couple of key features between the Paul Reed Smith 594 and my 2019 Gibson Les Paul Standard 60 spec. Now, before we go any further, this is not an incendiary, I hate Gibson or Paul Reed Smith or anything like that. This is kind of uh, some things that have popped out to me as a guitar player when playing this 594 and how things have kind of evolved since the original original design of the Gibson Les Paul. Um, I am not affiliated with Paul Reed Smith or Gibson. Uh, I have worked with Paul, Paul Reed Smith on some sponsored stuff in the past on this channel, but I have no skin in this proverbial game, but this will not be a bash fest of, oh, the Gibson's terrible and Paul Reed Smith is amazing. That's not what this is really about. This is me pointing out a few key changes that have been updated to that basic initial design that is the Gibson Les Paul. So before we talk about the individual guitars, we should probably talk about some context with which the companies exist. Paul Reed Smith uh, generates as a company about $30 million a year, and they have just under 300 or so employees. Those are big numbers, and Paul Reed Smith is very, very successful at what they do. They are respected worldwide and they have been around, you know, Paul Reed Smith started making guitars in like late seventies, early eighties. Now on the flip side of that coin, you have Gibson Guitar, which employ about 1500 people and generate about $393 million a year. Now I'm not really sure if that's all of Gibson brands, you know, the parent company with which all other sub brands are included or not. But my point is the difference in size between these two companies is substantial. This really is a David and Goliath kind of comparison, but I do still want to compare the two guitars because well, a it's fun and we're going to learn something. So the first thing I want to talk about is the headstock design and how it facilitates the string travel on the Gibson Les Paul. You have famously, a binding issue on the G string and the D string because of the angle with which the string travels after going through the nut slot to its respective tuning key. Paul Reed Smith have redesigned their headstock or redesigned the three and three concept with a string pole that is almost straight. It's basically straight enough and you get incredible tuning stability with this design. But, I mean, people have been playing Les Pauls for, you know, 50 years plus, 60, 70 years. So maybe that's not such a big deal. Now, the second thing I wanna compare are the actual factory tuners. The Gibson Les Paul standard, the 60s standard, comes with sealed Grover tuners. Now, these are a pretty much a, a, a standard in the Les Paul world, I would say. Uh, back with the original guitars, a lot of people uh, like Jimmy Page replaced the original Klusen tuners with Grovers for added tuning stability. These are non-locking tuners and they feel okay. They're a little sloppy, but it's a Grover. So you know what to expect when you get it. However, on the Paul Reed Smith, you have 
a locking tuner, which is an open design, and you can see the gears. It is very, very smooth, but the locking mechanism is what I truly love about the Paul Reed Smith because it's just a little thumb wheel. And if you want to tighten it a little bit more, there's a slot for the screwdriver. This also adds to the already very stable tuning stability and uh, it's, it's awesome. The third thing I want to talk about is the evolution of the Tunomatic style bridge. Now, the bridge on the Gibson Les Paul is legendary. It's the Gibson Tunomatic bridge and it's gone through several different iterations. There's an Asheville bridge, there's the ABR1 bridge, etc., etc. But basically what you have is you have a knife edge for the saddle that the string rides upon and then continues on to the guitar nut. This is an okay design, but often you have a very severe angle coming from the stop bar if you adjust it all the way down or if you have larger, uh, larger gauge strings, you will touch and often rub on the uh, bridge housing itself with the string angle attaching or trying to get to the anchor point that is on the stop bar. Now the Paul Reed Smith McCarty 594, on the other hand, has solid brass uh, saddles and the saddles themselves are angled and it is not a knife point, which I found very, very interesting. Uh, high mass, not a knife edge, and the string rests in a groove and kind of just, it lays on top of the saddle and then continues to the nut. This feels good. This feels good to play. Also, um, this visually looks very, very nice, but it adds a lot of mass, which adds to sustain and overall frequency response of the entire guitar. This is where all of the business is happening with a guitar and a knife edge I, with wound strings. I don't know, man. This really seems like the better design to me as a player. Now, the last thing I want to compare are the neck joints. Now, the neck joint on the Paul Reed Smith is pretty similar to a Gibson Les Paul. The body joint is still at the 17th fret. However, in practice, I can get my hand all the way up the fretboard on the Paul Reed Smith. Now, on the Gibson Les Paul, the join is at the 17th fret. And if, if I put my hand here just without looking and I indexed my thumb on the back of the neck where that heel is, I'm still, I'm still five or six frets away from the bottom of the neck axis. Not that I personally play that, but if anyone was, your natural inclination is to stop at that neck heel. You're not out of frets yet, which you know what? People have been making do with the Gibson Les Paul being just like this for 70 years. Now, is this really a problem? People have been playing the Gibson Les Paul for 70 years and it's a classic for a reason. It's a great guitar. Is this really a problem for me? No, because I'm not playing up here very often, but if you do, just another thing to consider. So what does this all mean? I do think Gibson is stuck in its own history. Could that string angle be better on a Les Paul design wise? Yeah, absolutely. Are they gonna change a legendary instrument to move the, the tuning pegs in a little bit? No, no, they, they probably will never do that. However, a company like Paul Reed Smith, just to give you an example, you know, they've had several different iterations of the Paul Reed Smith locking tuner. They used to have these weird wings on the tuners uh, that you would have to kind of trim the string and put it through. Players hated it. Most players hated those tuners. And so they listened to their customers and they adapted and they came up with a different and in my opinion, much better design. And that's just for the tuners. They're always constantly improving their guitars and I think that speaks a lot to how the different companies operate. Politics aside, it's just a very, very interesting look at an evolution of where a design came from. This is where we were and this is where we are now. And it's pretty cool to be able to hold both in my hands. I love both of these guitars. I just thought all of these uh, individual features were very, very interesting and I thought I would share them with you. 
All applicable links down below in the description. You've been wonderful, I've been Fluff. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed the video that you just watched, please consider subscribing. It helps me help you and then in turn you get more stuff to watch and also I have all sorts of stuff down in the description of this video. Sweetwater giveaway stuff, there's all sorts of links to all sorts of things so consider uh, checking that out as well if you're gonna hang. But if you don't hang, all good. I still love you.